Welcome everyone to the Dublin Book Festival. I'm delighted to have you all here today. We're extremely honoured to have this event as part of our programme. Could everyone please stand and welcome the President of Ireland, President Michael D. Higgins. I would also like to welcome Paddy Woodworth, author and journalist, who will be in conversation with President Michael Higgins. Enjoy the event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julianne, for inviting us. And th thank you very much, President Higgins, for inviting me to do this interview. And uh, I don't feel up to it, quite honestly, because my, my intellectual reach is a lot shorter than yours. But um, I'll, 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 I'll do my very best. Well, none of this humility works. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd just like to start off with a little introduction of how sure. I've experienced this book, Reclaiming the European Street, which you should buy afterwards if you haven't bought already. Um, I want to thank you for uh, a book that demands that we rethink the European Union profoundly. And I think it's important to say that notwithstanding your strong and long-standing support for the European project, you engage unflinchingly with its current defects. And it struck me that in this book you describe the, the post-war German Social Democrat leader, Kurt Schumacher, as a passionate advocate of European unity and at the same time a trenchant critic and opponent of defective institutional design and of the absence of ethical intent in the specific projects of the Union. And it struck me reading that that that's a little bit like a self-portrait also, because it seems to me that you do give unwavering support to a more integrated Union. And you celebrate in this book the, the very specific historical and contemporary cultural, scientific and political links between Ireland, as only you could, between Ireland and a dozen of our EU partners mm -hmm. in the speeches that make up the book. But you're also frank and you're unrelenting in exposing what you see as a dangerous and widening gap between the lived experience of the European street, the citizens, mm. and the foundational social principles of the Union. And it interests me that you go back to such diverse figures as the French Christian Democrat, Robert Schuman, obviously on a different point on the political spectrum to yourself, Jean Monnet, and very especially the Italian communist Altiero Spinelli in the 1942 Ventotene Manifesto, yeah. which you cite a number of times in the book. And I note that you contrast the Union's long-established culture of accommodation, respect, and compromise with the emerging trend of extremist language and the coarsening of our discourses on the street, in social, and indeed in the mainstream media. And if I may summarize, as I understand it, you attribute this gap between the EU's ideals and the European street to the dominance since the 1980s of a neoliberal orthodoxy devoid of democratic le uh, legitimacy, so-called financial markets, credit rating agencies, and the declining course of social welfare and law. Now, there's so many other points in the book that I could mention but I, I just want to say that you, you do say that this neoliberal orthodoxy has um, created, to some degree, I think you suggest, the anger that we're seeing on the European streets, sometimes in very ugly forms, yeah. uh, through the imposition of austerity. And you go further. You argue that this orthodoxy being unaccountable to democratic institutions, this neoliberal orthodoxy, may make democracy itself impossible, yes. these are very strong words, and usher in an authoritarian century. Yeah. Finally, you cite Habermas as a, a guide, perhaps, out of this dilemma. You suggest that the, the Commission, the European Commission, should be much more accountable to, um, to the Council, but very especially to the Parliament. And you endorse Habermas's notion of deliberate, de deliberative democracy, where citizens are informed and enabled to participate in key debates. And you also state, which I find very interesting, I'd like to come back to, 
that um, the state itself must be repossessed by its citizens if we are to transform societies for the benefit of the citizenry. For you say that the state still holds the capacity and much of the resources for democratic control of a nation's economy and finances. And very important in the book too is you say we need to connect ethics, ecology, and economy. And ecology is dear to my own heart. And in Dorsey and Goff's proposal for a new global order that will support the achievement of an eco-social welfare state. So I thought we could kick off for the day that's in it with the conclusion of COP26 in Glasgow, which still hasn't concluded or hadn't 10 minutes ago when I last looked. Um, I'd like to start with environmental in, uh, uh, issues. And you've long recognized the critical importance of the biodiversity and climate crisis and their interrelation. And I remember a wonderful speech that you gave in 2019 at the National Biodiversity Conference. You can take uh, off your mask while you're coming to that good oh, bit. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was so fixated. That... No, no, oh. you're good, yes. <laughs> but no, at the National, I had national Biodiversity, yes. So yeah. I, I just want, want, before asking you the first question, to, to quote, if I may, and I hope I'm not sure. mangling the quote now, but at that, in that speech you said, and you brought the house down in a good way, and also you, you chilled us at the same time, uh, you said that if we were miners, if human beings today were miners, we would be up to our necks in dead canaries. Mm. And things haven't gotten any better since then, and we've had the pandemic, which you do suggest our response could be helpful in developing our response to the climate and biodiversity crises. But I'm very struck that you frequently counsel against pessimism. But I'd like to ask you today, what <laughs> grounds can you give us for optimism in the wake of the agonizingly slow progress, if it is slow progress at COP26? Well, may I, first of all, that's a, a marvelous agenda of questions that you're <laughs> But uh, I, and I was trying to uh, hold them. I was wondering, uh, should I write them down in my diary and not from Cambridge? Um, I'll come get them again. I just, to, to, to utilize our time-based pessimism, yes. Uh, when I write about pessimism, I'm speaking to myself mostly, to tell you the truth about it. And I've started writing again. And I said to somebody who was asking me what I was writing, and I said, I'm trying to get over my Adorno-esque moment. And, and that enables me to answer your other question, I think, as well. And that was about the delivery of technology into our lives. And running through that book, the, uh, the, my book is where you, there's a great, there's an influence of the debate in the Frankfurt School. And if you like, there was a long while I was looking at the, of Marcuse's correction of, 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 uh, uh, of Theodore Adorno's pessimism. And that was necessary. Then you have uh, Habermas uh, uh, and, and deliberative democracy, which is part of that tradition as well, uh, as indeed um, is um, a whole string of new people, including the author of Resonance, for example, uh, whom I quote very much uh, in, in some of my work. It's, I think, uh, um, we have reached a point of sensibility in relation to how seriously the planet itself is in danger. And when I, I, where the moments of possible optimism are, are, if you like, the possible combination of new forms of consciousness. A consciousness really that is there in Ian Goff's book, Heat, Greed and Human Need, where you combine, if you like, the consciousness of the threat of biodiversity, the threat of the environment in general, you combine that uh, with deepening fissures of inequality. And also, if you like, uh, the collapsing paradigm and the need for a new paradigm of economics. And maybe the most important parts of what I'm writing was the case for uh, an eco-social just form of economics within a framework of ecological responsibility. I think we're very far from that, and uh, 
one of the things that I do know, don't, I think I do refer to it once maybe in the book, is I was at uh, the Economics and Development Conference in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, and I was interviewing people for a documentary. We were making Nine Days to Save the World or something like this, or Seven Days to Save the World. And I interviewed, among others, uh, Mr. Agnelli, who was vice president of the Business Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, the people from the threatened areas, for example, I interviewed them on the Greenpeace boat because they weren't directly allowed at that conference. They were in, you had people speaking for them, Denmark, you know, Britain, you had France and so forth. But he was maybe one of the most brilliant uh, former capitalists I've ever encountered he, because he was a vice chairman of the Business Council for Sustainable Development. And they had decided that if capitalism was to reinvent itself, it had to take on this word sustainable that everyone was using. And in exactly the same way, the downside of all of this is that you now have maybe some of the most seriously threatening corporations are preparing to say, we are really with you in relation to the new responsibility, but we will have to do it, and we will need adjustment like this. And then they are not beyond the impertinence of looking for the state to step in to probably compensate them in some form for adjustments which are appalling and so on. Now, but that is, that's why the pessimistic side of it, the optimistic side of it is the combination of the discourses. The discourses, if they can combine, and also, as well as that, the, the, the way that they make it into the, into, the, into the rhetoric. Your other questions, and you raise many, I, I'll pause there because I do want to answer them, but why I think there is this uh, gap. Uh, uh, in, uh, I'll talk to you about Europe as you wish. Yeah, well, I think I just, on the, on the pessimism and optimism and your, your, your view that new forms of consciousness are emerging, I think they are, but to be devil's advocate, I think what has been terribly distressing over the last 10 yeah. years, when the, when as, the, as the evidence has got harder and harder and, and convinced a broader and broader public that we face these crises, uh, at the same time we are seeing an extraordinary reversion to very primitive forms of capitalism, with yes. Trump, with Brexit, yes. of capitalism and nationalism, and, and an anti-rationalism. So I suppose that's why it's, um, you mentioned Adorno. I think Adorno said that in the, in the fascist period that we need to develop um, uh, pessimism of the intellect but optimism of the will, wasn't yeah, that? Yeah, that, that it. So I hope, I hope you're right about the new emergence, but then let's go back to the roots, as you say, and I, I'd, like, I'd like you to take us right back to the Ventotene Manifesto. And well, that's... Altiero uh, Spinelli and, and Rossi, of course, is very important. And they are in prison on the island under Mussolini when, uh, when they're writing this. And uh, curiously, they are writing about something that enables me to take up another point you've just said in relation to nationalism. They speak about achieving, if you like, um, equal, not very divided, nations. Within, and then nations that... Be because of the way they have done it, will have created the capacity to agree with other nations on fundamental international values. Uh, they are communists, yes, indeed. And uh, now you have to contrast that, for example, uh, with the writings about the coal and steel community. What has not been addressed, and running through not just my book, but uh, others who are writing, Middle R, Middle R and all of those others, which he, he, he avoids it actually, or uh, uh, Middle R, because is the way the, uh, that what suited the coal and steel community stayed in the European Union and uh, is so clearly insufficient, both institutionally, discourse terms, and also in relation to the attractions of the street. But bear in mind something that I think our audience won't hear very much from, but it's something I hope that if I have years left to address myself, is the incredible 1930s in Ireland. You know, I, 
The two men I mentioned, Rossi and, uh, and Spinelli, are in prison on the most innocent. But you must remember there are newspapers, including some that would be familiar to you, who on the 3rd of March 19 they are writing editorials saying her Hitler is about to introduce great order in Germany and his results will be bring. And it's in that phrase, uh, by the way, the, the terrible phrase is used, uh, omelettes can't be made without eggs having to be broken, referring to the rounding up of the communists in Germany. Now, when you look at this fear of communism, it actually is one of the most dangerous currents. It's there in the 1920s, it's, uh, and it will run right through the decade of the 1930s in Ireland, giving us what is in fact an, an appalling period in Irish history, in every sense, in gender sense, in belief sense, in, uh, in uh, the authoritarian sense as well, and so on. You, you see, you, we need care about nationalism. There is about the na people, the nationalism, the people have a sense of, of place and they have a sense of culture, they have a sense of long memory. Of, of they have home, a, home, yes, the concept of home is a That is in my when I, Yes, I, 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 and I move on, remember, from, from Heidegger to Bachelor, I think it was 50 years later when I was discussed, where I was discussing, writing that piece. But, this is very important. It actually could become an easy slogan to say uh, that the problem in Europe at the present time is na nationalism. It, it is in fact more accurate to say the, the origins of many of the problems in Europe are the inability to, dis to, do, to, to uh, move away from concepts of empire. Uh, I have to say in my new manifestation of myself as president when I'm writing Bokhtov and all the rest of it. The hardest thing to write, the hardest thing in terms of getting unfavorable way was when I was addressing the issue of empire. And it is still there. You know, in the book I discuss, for example, the serious disability that Europe has in dealing with Africa. Lesser slightly, but not great, the, the difficulty about dealing with South and Central America. And the main reason is, is that the exercise that I put, my, uh, that we're involved in, in Machna, which, uh, which opened, Machna number four is going to be broadcast on the 25th. I just finished writing a piece yesterday, um, but we have very good contributors. But that's an exercise in. in saying no to amnesia, but also trying to ethically uh, negotiate different versions, what we, what, uh, what we would call, as a, uh, Richard Carney probably would call, a hospitality of narratives. But what, where, where, who, where has that happened in Europe? In fairness to President Macron, he has made two speeches, one in Burkina Faso and another one, which is so I'm interested that Macron is actually the, Euro the contemporary European leader who you, who you praise most highly in the book. For, on the basis of addressing issues of memory, because the attitude in many, you, you, you fall it to think of countries like, uh, when I think about Belgium, but, well, that's you. and the assumption is, is, is that everyone has moved on. Well, you talk to Africans and they say, well, no, uh, we haven't forgotten. And, and this is the, the if I, when I move on about right, and when I, what I was trying to do was, uh, Trying to, uh, I was as a, as a political scientist myself, and teaching it for so many years. I was always very interested in politics as symbol, you know, that work about symbolism, and I, I think the symbol, the symbol, the symbolic presentation of themselves by the institutions of the European Union uh, can be humorous, you know, as they jostle for the family photograph. And, who wants to be where and who's in which, that kind of thing. But it's, see, it's much more, more than that. It is about the insufficiency of the symbolic connection, the insufficiency of the discourse. There you, you're a donor question. And therefore, is that, that the quiet, the superb blandness achieved by the bureaucracy. But the you, problem you, about that is, is that if the next thing, if, there's, if the ideas are not being transacted and the language isn't connected to it on the street, you leave people open to the worst forms of extremism in for calling up hate. And even in our discourse so far now, 
how much of it, for example, has been based on what might be called responding to the politics of fear? At my age, at eight years of age, and all of the rest of it, I just think there are places still where, and but it is so important now to look at the positives about and about the cases. Let us say, when you hear about young people are caring about biodiversity, not only young people, but those great people of older generations who've had these views and who have sustained them. But we need that. I, I, I am struck by the paucity of the philosophical contribution well, I wanted, in Europe. I wanted to ask you about that because you, you take the yes. university, and it strikes me as, you know, uh, as you say, a political scientist and a, yeah. a former teacher yourself, um, still a teacher, um, but... Um, you, you say that there, that there has been, there has been a, a very radical decline in the quality of the discourse in our universities. I and do. it strikes me that many of the concepts that you talk about, uh, the concept of the state, for example, yeah. and, and, and the public sector and the public good, these are topics that are almost unmentionable. That the triumph of the neoliberal yes. orthodoxy in our universities. Why do you think our universities have been so susceptible to that? And I, I'm wondering, is it to do with the way they're financed? Well, we all know that businesses now have names all over our universities. Yes, I, I do think that. I think, uh, could I do, you, I think I have in the book somewhere, uh, I don't want to lose your question now, but one of the things about in relation to the Anthropocene, uh, there were empires before uh, 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 the empires that really reconstituted themselves after the world wars and whatever. And they had made achievements in printing and they had made very significant achievements and so on. Uh, you might argue what was their effect on the, on the, on, 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 on our, our, on the, the planet. And to some extent, it was lesser because what was unique about, let us, the period from 1760 to 1830, the Industrial Revolution, and the commercial, is it, its ability to 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 to, to attach resources. There's an older philosophical statement, the one I used a long time ago, of Bacon's one. I lead to you nature in bondage. I lead to you nature and your children in bondage for your usage to gouge out her, gouge out her secrets. That's, oh, I wrote that in the 1970s, long time, for God's sake. But the fact of the matter about it is, you do look at it is, you had that extraction of resources, which is a specific of particular form, supported by colonisation and supported by the movement and capturing of empire and so on. And that is a very significant contribution uh, 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 within, within the Anthropocene. So where you are then, uh, in a way, uh, no, no more than in, uh, in other places I have written, is that those who hold power then uh, develop a attitudes about inferiority and superiority. You have, you know, I went, went off in the 1960s to the United States and to learn the new sociology. Of, and therefore, the present, I remember Orlando Falls Border at the same time writing uh, the, uh, about the ideological classes of North Americans studying Latin America. But we were there to study the backwardness of our people. And then you had the continuum of countries developed. Standing behind that was the idea of progress. Then you have all the literature on development. And then you have the institutions set up, if you like, to give a form of development which is not reeling with indigenous realities, is not dealing responsibly with the combination of resources and so on. So, so, am, am I just a negative person? No. You asked me your very first question about where is the Bell Pub. I think that the next decades are going to be decades in which the indigenous peoples will be forefronting. They're, they are. They were present, directly represented in my, in my say for the first time. I think that they will have made a big, great contribution at COP26. I think that they will have more confidence. 
What you do find about it in many cases is that the role of the state, we need it. You couldn't handle it. You can, we won't be able to handle uh, what is facing us all without and, and I, an active role or in relation to COVID. So, yeah, that's uh, what I was going to yeah, ask you. Has, has the pandemic, I mean, it seems to me you're describing an arc where the European Union had, had two roots, if you like, very crudely speaking. It, it had the roots of the coal and steel community which are unabashedly capitalist, if you like. Yeah. But you've had a lot of social thinkers also uh, on board with the project. But it seems that from the 1980s on, really, um, social democracy either destroyed itself or, or was just outmaneuvered. It was, out, it was outmaneuvered. It was outmaneuvered. And I'm, I have to be careful. No, I don't have to be careful at all, really. <laughs> but the point about it is, uh, I'm not going to ask I you about that. I can tell you the change about in the 1960s when I was in, in uh, I was going to UCG for, at 21 years of age, and going to their libraries. It was then picking up uh, a book by Hartley Withers in defence of capitalism. Actually, there were periods in the 1960s. This is the the point about it when there was a very serious critique of, if you like, the inadequacy of that, that particular form of capitalism, you had still in the 60s a memory of the great achievements. Let us say one of those, one of the great achievements in the history of humanity is the British National Health Service. Yes. Uh, and um, you have people like Titmus, who died in a public hospital, writing about all of this. And, Let's be good in the, the, the social Europe, which I haven't mentioned in my but the 20 principles that are there, they're good. Not everything has withered and died or anything like that. But we had a moment of hubris. And that moment of hubris, you know, uh, wasn't only about leaders. Uh, Sigmund Bauman, who died just a few months ago, really it was last year, spoke about people having been consumed in their consumption. It's interesting about the way, I, from your own profession in many cases, is the decline of the essay tradition. I've said that you, I must answer your question about the universities because I have published. I, gave, I spoke to the Association of Rectors of European Universities about what was happening in the universities. Then I, I've done, a, I've actually given a number of those speeches, but the last one I was getting tired about it all and uh, I had been talking about inequality within the university system. But I said, maybe it is in fact that the whole ground has been swept from beneath your feet at the university itself in the same way as in tourism, people would kind of say to us, this was an abbey, this is where they had vespers, this is where they actually got up in the morning and they had this and this and that. That so people would be bringing people, people will be bringing tourists through scenes, places of universities, and said they had students who used to be in places like this here. <laughs> There's, this is where they had their books, etc. That, and then they went on to a bookless thing, and there was that, and people would say, and those are real books, yes, yes, and things like that. And they point. All of this. The fact is, and, uh, in many cases, the way the nature of thought, the way that in an originality and and the quietness, and also the excitement and all of the excesses and the. In many cases, I thought it was irresponsible, I should say, that any serious university should have between 15 and 20 percent of eccentricity. <laughs> and maybe I was lucky to that. This is not an argument against the hardworking people who are working in intolerable conditions. But I do think that people's uh, advancement in the university, I'll be very direct, advancement in the university, recruitment to universities, arrangements of research should not be on the basis of you having to declare first the amount of money that you have brought to the university. That's, that is that a seems disaster. To be a huge corruption of, it of is. the academic world. It is, yes. So, and you look, for example, at where I had mentioned Africa earlier, look at the connection that those the leaders that emerged post 1966 in Africa had with the London School of Economics. And you look at the history of the London School of Economics and you see what happens after, for example, the Darendorf moment. And then you get onto the press. I'm not interested in knocking anything. I, I had, I think it was a wonderful, it's a great, great gift to be a university teacher, which I had that great bit. Uh, so and also the interaction uh, with students and the, 
and the interaction with people. Uh, but isn't that, do you find talking to academics today, I, I find my contacts with universities... They're very that, tense. ...that people are very, they, they feel Pressure. that they don't have the time to engage with their students, to mentor students, yeah. that it'd be because they're always supposed to be out pub either publishing for the prestige and status or getting grants. Um, and, yeah. and that's a huge... And that's then there are the societies as well. But I don't want to be... It's not just the, the main thing about we must support the staff in universities. Uh, by the way, I have to confess a, a direct interest here, and that is, is that I set up the Workers' Union of Ireland teaching section, and mm. and uh, it was a, a, in, in, in the, indeed our, our our dear friend, the Irish Federation of University Teachers, was set up by a very, our, one of our great distinguished defenders against apartheid and all of the rest of it. And he and I travelled throughout the country. He effectively got everyone from associate professor. This is Kader And I, Kader yeah. And Kader and I would go to all the different institutions and I made my case. So we were, I was in favour of the, the, the one union that would have lab assistants and groundsmen and uh, all of that. So effectively, I, I, I got to about 200 in my first round around the thing from a bunch uh, uh, associate lecturer down. And now there's a good relationship between Mark Jennings and I for and the entire section. So, but it, it, this is the thing about the atmosphere. And it isn't, I'm making no, no, no case for anything archaic. The, it, it's the, the relationship of teaching and the red but more important even still about it, curiosity. When I started as a teacher, just to say in the university, remember, there were people coming into university for the first time who, who didn't, and their parents, like myself, their parents, nobody had, they had never been near a university before. And a lot of us, Caro the two, you can make like myself, there were, the, bar, the embargo was lifted. So a lot of us came at the same time. And we had to do things like, there weren't tutorials in Goa, remember? We set them up and we used to say, everyone between, said we offered to do, the, and we offered to do uh, um, ed courses around the country through the through, through ed education and, and that. But that is, uh, in, in, a, in a way, has an effect uh, on the quality of our lives in Ireland, particularly sure. in the structure of the professions. The well, professions are very narrowly drawn still in Ireland. And uh, uh, God be good to all of them and, uh, and, uh, and the rest of it. But <laughs> really, uh, I can think of so many professions that are not really uh, genuinely open are in fact diverse as they might be in a republic and so on. But you see, this is as I was thinking when you asked me what, when we're coming along to talk about, uh, there's enough pessimism and darkness around really. We have to think about uh, a bit of excitement getting it going now. And you're going to, I think, there in many cases, just think of it if I was, if I was young again about it, you're going to have better economics. People will regard what you speak taught in the United States as Economics 101. They'd say you can't be serious. They weren't teaching that kind of thing, were they? And uh, there'd be better economics, there'd be a better connection in the social sciences. It's extraordinary there. Uh, we, I think we're, we're in a sense lucky in that I, I do sense in, in Irish society, yeah. even in a way like the transformation yeah. that is happening, flawed as it is yeah. within Board Namona and companies like that, and with the communities that have been supported yeah. by Borden and Mona in the past, we're having to make a very difficult transition. But I'd like, if I may, there's one thing that strikes me that, because I think it's really important, and I, I happen to agree with you, that we do need to revive the role of the state and the public sector. Yes. But at the same time, I have to recognise, as a socialist from the 70s and the 80s, yes. that the state was perceived by many people and the unions were also perceived. We, we think about people like Arthur Scargill, for example. Yes. There, th there was a, a move that, that was a rejection of an overbearing power of the state yes. and an overbearing power of the unions, and that in a way opened the door for Thatcher and Regan's so-called revolution. Um, how do we reinvent the state, reinvent unions? in a way that will be attractive to people now and that will Good. try to avoid those flaws. Yes, there is, it should be the great union membership has, has fallen all over Europe. I, I would 
quite frankly say, this is their great moment. Lead to the green transition in relation to the connection between the, what is required in, in environment, in relation to also decent, the, re, the redefining of work, the application of technology in a citizen model. It's a great opportunity and uh, for, uh, for, for the unions. And they should place themselves, you know. And they're actually not far off. And if you look at the work of TASC, and you look at how similar, if you like, the view of TASC is to the view of NESC, which is NESC, which is handling the technological transition, sure. which is the green transition, and the others. So it's a time for, uh, a time for ideas. The main uh, thing that we... we you see, remember, my book is after all reclaim, about reclaiming the European street, and regular people ask me questions about Germany and Germany and, uh, and and all of that. I I do think there is a real, there is a there is there is an absence of vision, and it is not associated with the greatest respect to the departure of the Chancellor. It's related to the idea about what do we want Europe to be, and as I. With where I said very early on, the coal and steel community, for example, is very different from you. And you would have to, when you ask, like for example, I'll give you an example. Let us suppose we said, we are in a moment in where there is globally, you have a, the lowest, a low interest environment, a great opportunity of leveling up the capital deficiencies in infrastructure, for example, between what would be insultingly called surplus countries like Germany and deficit countries like the Mediterranean countries. You could, in fact, actually interpret parts of the Lisbon Treaty to say that this is some, what exactly you should do now. But then you could also go to the Maastricht Treaty and find elements that would be used to justify an interpretation of fiscal rules to say, so that you could create a whole new movement and you could get an abstract, an abstract, and I say it is abstract, monetized theory, which in fact could wreck everything. And that is where, if you like, after COVID-26, people like me who've been around a long time, there has been such slow, slow uh, a, a, a change in relation to the international financial institutions. And I could give you a practical example because I have been in touch with some of the island countries who are most at risk. The string, what is laid down in those international institutions by way of criteria that they have to fulfil, they are in fact uh, uh, saying things like you mustn't be, mustn't be for development, it must fit the categories like this. There's a very, very great deal of that going on. So you will have uh, outrageous suggestions, for example, uh, where we're not far from it, uh, that corporations should be treated as persons, but island communities know. Then you have equally the other one about it is that some of the worst polluting corporations, in fact, should be assisted with uh, from public taxation in in fact putting an end to their worst actions this is just simply but it is where the power lies for many places and in many cases those who have in fact you you mentioned what it from your time in the 70s let's speak sometimes maybe we should have written about it i'm uh, older than you but the one of the things about it's you could that we should have people should have been more critical of stalin earlier on Stalin destroyed it in many cases. Then you have also other places where you had abuses of the of, of what of statism and abuses of statism that wrecked the opportunities of socialism. But one of the most things about where uh, when I when I if I will write again about it too is uh, in relation to when you get a conjunction say between conservatives in Ireland. Uh, in as it appears, with the church, with the, to speak about the communist fear. The 30s I mentioned, there were communists were coming, but they, were, they actually got so far as that after a ceremony in Dublin to burden Connolly Hall before anyone could be in it. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, this kind of fear, and in a way, uh, as I look north and all of the rest of it, when you look at how the politics of fear is exploited, 
uh, you, you see two authoritarianisms are becoming ever tighter and tighter and tighter in rock-like. They share authoritarianism in terms of exclusions and so forth, but they're actually moving away to such an extent that they're losing the capacity to examine themselves and therefore move to a new place. I think that's changing. I think there are young people all over this island. I think there are people in the middle ground on this island. They want responsible, uh, inclusive economics, so caring. You, they, people want the words compassion and care to be given attention. And they also are in favor of a kind of a politics of listening and so on. The well, other part that... of it where I mentioned to me is that about the disappearance of the essay tradition. The quality of political thought is a, is a real concern uh, uh, in Europe. Well, and does, I, does the idea that you cite repeatedly in the book of deliberative democracy, does, yeah. that, does that offer a model? And what would it look like compared to the kind of democracy yeah. we enjoy or don't enjoy in this country at the moment? Well, uh, uh, Habermas is now 92. Uh, and, uh, of course... He's from that tradition, and he really put most uh, of his hope in relation to, uh, if, well, first, uh, constitutional. Could you do it? He was working out of a legal system that you'd have, uh, um, and that would give you a legitimation for a kind of Europe in which you would get transacted policy. Because remember, you still have the point of a European Parliament that doesn't have an opposition. It has committee system and so forth. So you, he was very much hopeful in 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 in, in that uh, in that particular way. I, I think. Uh, uh, is the commission? In, how huge... would you do it in the commission? Please, you is, ask. Is, me. Is, 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 is the commission a huge part of the problem? Because the the perception that we have, which has some truth in it, of you know a a, a Mandarin bureaucracy in Brussels. That, and I mean, I the think commission isn't the problem. The commi what's the problem very much is because remember when we joined and all the rest of it, countries other than the strongest saw the commission as their friend. And remember, if you wanted, for example, to get uh, the working day, if you wanted in relation to get equality in the employment place, and all, we'd much thank the commission. The relationship, it's the relationship between the commission and the council. And I'm not referring to the I mean, the European Council, so forth, which, with its quasi-constitutional basis, uh, and uh, and uh, you you have a problem. That, that, for example, there are fictions that become a weapon people are aware of that. Do, for example, the 27 now that it is 27 meet equally at it in a discourse? No. The point is there are several everywhere are side meetings in advance which accept the, the possibility of, uh, uh, of, of, of what we can get others to do. Now, that's weak because, and in the discussion I have about, for example, about, uh, uh, about Echebine, you see, is it likely that out of the new German arrangements, for example, I've discussed this with the German president too, very politely and all the rest of it, that we will see a kind of hegemony, uh, would say, we want to give away so much, you see, to many. Uh, these countries are not in favour of, of, of levelling up. And then the other side of it, which is, I think, interesting in a way, is... I think it's Ulrich von Kockel. Remember, he was working up in Hansdorf. I think he's teaching one of the Scottish universities now. He raised something I remember when I was preparing something. I asked him a question, and it's about, can you be, in fact, an enthusiastic uh, uh, person for the European Union and at the same time love your place? And it's about how, in a way, you can take from where you are your experiences. And remember, they're not just only, you're not, it's not a tabula rasa. There are assumptions, there are things that weigh, that people, what importance people attach to different things. There's culture, music, and everything. There could and should have been an assurance that none of this was at stake, that you could, in fact, have all of these authenticities of being and at the same time be speaking in favour of the, be in, fa be in favour of sharing it. Uh, 
And that's the distinction between the Vintetene, why I have quoted it so much, and the statements that have come out from different places at different times. I just, I, I think we should probably turn to the audience now. Um, but just, it's interesting that I, I have to admit, I, I had never heard of the Ventitani Manifesto until I read your book. And I didn't know that the name of an Italian communist was on the European Parliament. That, yes, it know, is So indeed. those roots have kind of been Well, Spinelli first. came here, you know, to, to, uh, to campaign. He campaigned in Ireland. In uh, the 70s? It, yes, it come, yes, indeed, I remember it. And uh, he was a... You, you, were, you were on the other side then, though, were you? I was, and he was... And, and, and that's how I know him so well, because <laughs> the other thing was as well, he, he was against the imposition of uh, American-style agriculture on Europe. He actually had a view in which... He knew the distinction between it. Well, he's, between he's, a, he's obviously worth going back to. But may I, 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 it's going to be hard. I don't know if the lights can be altered slightly because I can barely see people, but if you can raise your hand and wave it, I should be able to see it. Oh, sorry, okay. is there somebody? Yes, I'm sorry, as I say, I can't, I can't see anything, but... Um, I'm an avid supporter of the European Union. I'm a proud I can't supporter. Hear. Um, I note with uh, interest your use of the word project um, when you talk about Europe, the Euro European project. And by definition, project is finite. Does that mean, or should I draw a conclusion that we see the European project as something that will finish? Yes, I, 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 I get that. You, excuse my mic, it seemed as though it, it is just with masks, I find it hard to understand. Your point, question isn't really a bit, should, when I, because I use the word European project, yes, that should we see, I don't know that I use the word European project actually. Maybe, maybe I used it in, but, in but summarizing the book. And, uh, uh, <laughs> And uh, no, I, but your question is a very good one indeed. Uh, if I, w I, I wouldn't use it, so uh, no, I wouldn't use it now for this reason. It is that uh, it's, a, it's a term that is appropriate for the coal and steel community. And it is about the stabilization of, uh, uh, it's a step. Now, Perry Anderson has written about uh, 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 this as well, and uh, about if you look at the, how important the coal and steel community was in relation and its appointment, for example, of the members of the European Court of Justice, there's a question about is justice really for the resolution of the disputes of corporations, the disputes of industry, or is it about something broader? Where are the sources of the jurisprudence and all of that kind of thing? The project only, I think, I would prefer to use the, uh, the phrase the future. Uh, I see everything changing, frankly. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking that when I uh, regularly, if you, after the life I've had in many, many ways, and I think of the United Nations, um, there's a very, there's a very interesting, uh, Erskine Childers the third wrote it. He, he wrote about the United Nations. He was an under secretary general, and he he wrote about whispers in the gallery, and he's describing the excitement of all the new nations arriving and so forth. And they thought, no more than that moment, which people deride too easily now, uh, the non-aligned nations and so forth. You have people saying so so that was just that time of the non-aligned nations, which raises. Uh, we could spend a month on it, uh, the contestable notion of modernity. And that's central in relation to intellectual work about what is modernity. And it answers your question about the state as well. That was just the state and everything. Now we're here we are, you see. Big, brave, fine, that we can take on any, that kind of macho capitalism. Can you imagine the idea, the arrogance, for example, of the, a professor in, uh, in, in the University of Chicago uh, after the, uh, the assassination of Ian uh, to, to bring his entire graduate class uh, uh, down to the thing and to give them positions running the Chilean economy? 
this hubris uh, about it all is 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 shocking. Uh, I don't I, about what I what I. I I I I don't I don't is it, I think it may be in it. Uh, I gave him a, a, a lecture at the University of Athens, I think, uh, which I dealt with. It, I looked at that issue of philosophy about trying to see things in the round, which is something I attributed to it, uh, uh, to, uh, to the Greeks. But the I, I liked if I just could interject there. I loved what you, when you were speaking to Greece at a time when. Greece was still being rather demonised within the yeah. European Union, and you kind of said, you know, it is not Greece that's indebted to the European Union. Europe is indebted yeah. to Greece. Which it was, a, a nice, uh, and I, uh, again, uh, uh, again, what I think, uh, the technology is still full of capacities in a way about making inf and that's good too, people, making information to people to really achieve transparency and so on. But I wouldn't use the word uh, uh, project. It also is too, it also is too, um, it's also too close uh, to empire, you see, for me. We've <laughs> another, another question over here Sorry, and one up uh, there, I can here, see. Yeah. So I'll start with the lady, I think, in the front row. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask a more general question relating to an earlier topic, because you were talking about the limitations right now at universities. Um, and you're talking about your book and this festival, you know, this relation to the arts and these important political topics. But as a postgraduate student now, more involved in the arts and literature, it can sometimes feel as if our contributions really are removed from reality and simply aren't as tangible as, you know, those directly involved in law or politics or research or anything. Do you, like, relating to optimism, do you have more of a message of hope for people in my position? Yes, I, 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 so again, it's, 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 I'm, I'm hearing through the mask, but the, the, uh, that's a comment on my, de my deafness rather than on your good self. But they, they, uh, in relation to the, the research student working in the political sciences, uh, you're, you're bringing about their future, is it? Yes, I think, uh, I, I, I hope I get your question right, it was about uh, the, 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 rest of the current research people involved in political research, is that right? Yes, and is there hope for them, I think. Is that yes, right? I do so. I, and you know one of the most interesting things uh, that, 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 is, that is happening as well is that old neglected work uh, is coming back in, there are pieces of hist social history that are feeding back. Uh, uh, and I think that history has improved enormously. And there's no question about that in relation to social history. There's a lot of work to be, be done. But in relation to another one where, 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 where you're saying, I'm, I'm thinking, what is one of the most striking things to me in Europe uh, is the, 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 the decision to drop anthropology. When I was at Manchester, and I found it quite fascinating uh, to, to hear the people who had actually come back from Africa, from places called the Rhodes Livingston Institute, and they had either come back or they'd been sent back or whatever, you know. I remember one day at the anthropology seminar, they, they, I won't mention his name, he said to me, one day, Michael, you must tell us about your own people. <laughs> but, the point, but at any event, anyway, why in, in the modern period, did, for example, countries not take up anthropology? It would be perfect for studying in Ireland. Uh, I was only looking at, when I say recovered new pieces of work, I think of a piece like Pat McNabb in the Limerick Rural Survey, and he's looking at the position. An extraordinary thing has happened beyond the our, our wars and civil wars, well, and, th and that was in relation to land inheritance. Because of land, and, you know, Arnsberg and Kemble came, yes, but we should have been to look at what was to happen. And he describes, for example, the non-inheriting sons of the farmers looking at them who have very little prospect of getting married. Well, either there's the point is they work for the sibling who is inherited, or they will immigrate, uh, and they talk among themselves. And what do they say? They say, for example, we have a lesser chance of getting married because of uh, than the than the children in the cottages and the labourers, because they were, of course, going to England. But there were also beautiful things in it as well, for example. Uh, I remember doing a piece of work, I had an assistant briefly, who we did some work on dances. 
and um, where a, a girl would say to another girl whether you decided to dance or not. He hasn't even been to England. <laughs> and now it, it did Present, refer, I, I, it referred to I the quality of the jiving, but it also referred now, probably I'm to more other experience as well. But you, it, I think it is a good time for the thing. And I think that uh, one, what about it all is, is that uh, uh, the old structural functionalism is as dead as a doornail. The other thing is about there were fashionable things when people didn't want to face up to structure. That's my big warning about it all. You had things like ethnomethodology which will, you'll excuse me if I'm making an extreme statement, I kind of regard as organised gossip. <laughs> but, uh, and then you also have, but there is important, great work to be done yet in structure. Look at an example, for example, about COVID, where we were men. How much did we know about older people and the cycles of their day, time, and so forth? How much did we know about young people? We had, we did carry out afterwards, uh, well, I won't destroy my reputation entirely by saying what I think of attitudinal post-hoc research, I'm but it's very different to anthropology. I'm going to, try and say, going to try and save your reputation. I think what you need for hope is a teacher like Michael D. Higgins. But, um, I think, have we time for one more question? One more question. Somebody's been trying to get in here a long time. I'm sorry. It's wonderful to hear you. Talking, and I wondered. I'm a woman who has benefit, benefit by being born yes. in the '70s, yes. and and as a disabled person, I've also benefited from the laws of Europe. However, I wonder with you comment in a nuanced way about the rise of formal fascism. Yes. Be it in the parliament or on the streets yes. or in corporate Europe. And how do we, first of all, how do we find the language to articulate that, particularly native indigenous people like Roma and yes. travelers. How do we, while holding on to your enthusiasm, somehow live with the real fear, which often translates into cynicism? How do we manage all that in a Europe and we're supposed to be holding up as a model of human rights yeah. and democracy. Thank you. I think that the question really is, is about, first of all, about, uh, 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 about human rights. Uh, human rights, are, uh, it is important that we realize that when a, when a right exists, uh, that it is not only supported, resourced, and vindicated, but the most important assurance for human rights is in the consciousness of the population in general. And therefore, it, it becomes about the interpretation of difference. And as I, I, most of my work as a sociologist was in the area of migration. And when I was looking at the theory of migration, what, the way that you get the worst uh, outcomes is when people invent a fear around migrants. We in Ireland should know very, very much about this ourselves, but that doesn't mean anything. It, well, it should mean something more than it does, but the, it is the interpretation of the other, the, whether the other is met with fear or with indeed. And that requires a huge, the, the look, the good news. If you look at the indications today, the survey that Finton is writing about in the Irish Times, he's right in many cases. You look at where there's, the Irish people are not afraid. Irish people, there's a very good set of indicators actually uh, about Ireland in welcoming uh, diversity. But it isn't enough. But where a sociologists would look at it as well is something that is very, very serious. If you are not disseminating and information adequately and so on. In such a way that you have a popularly supported acceptance of diversity and of 
people being able to accept difference uh, uh, and so on. You, you also, uh, uh, I think, there is a danger in relation to what we know from the study of gang behaviour and collective behaviour. When you look at some of the work that has been done in Europe in many cases, what starts as an individual piece of ignorance, when it is combined with the identification of a target, gives you a kind of a gang outcome. This was recognised a very, very long time ago in relation to study on gang behaviour by people like Jablonski, a famous study in Central Park in America, whatever. But it is very much repeating itself, the same kind of outcomes in relation to where co collective behaviour has been studied uh, uh, in, the European, in, in, in the European street. And the other thing about it is, Yes, you need resources to make, enable people uh, to feel safe, but you can't do it always by way of reaction uh, or a coercive uh, 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 action. It has in the end to be brought about. Uh, and uh, it, is, it, it can be done, and, but I'm very hopeful. Very, very hopeful is that uh, since I became president ten years ago, they, they, I went out to schools and so forth, and I see the children um, in different circumstances and the children from all these different countries and all the different languages being spoken. That is magnificent in a, in a way. We will all be uh, uh, be the better for it. The other thing, let me, the last point that you did, in which I think, I think I that's, do, a, that's a very good note maybe to end on. It is, because, it you know, running through my book as well, where I make the case for a kind of literacy that is sufficient for our times, including the new economics, the new ecology, the new rights, the new care, the new care. And above all else, what I would say as well, we never hear out of the European philosophy name or the word beauty. The sheer beauty that there is in a magnificent uh, uh, relationship or care or whatever like that. And my last point about it all is we are all going to be tested when we come back again by, in fact, when we haven't been able to touch. Aristotle privileged the sense of touch. Plato privileged the visual and so forth like that. So when this nightmare is over, there will have to be a lot of uh, abrazos. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, in conclusion, I'd just like to give a virtual abrazo, I hope, on behalf of all of us to our president for just his quite extraordinary contribution to our, to our lives as citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, President Higgins. The excitement of having you here has just been fantastic. So thank you so much. I was hoping you'd bring your dogs, though. <laughs> and Paddy, thank you so much um, for conducting the interview. We could have sat and listened to you for hours and hours. So thank you very much. And um, thank you to for everyone for coming out today and for everyone watching at home as well. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, the President's book will be for sale in the Gutter Bookshop. The doors will open here and we will be um, Bob is over in the bookshop selling the book. So thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Do you want to get a photo?